Hi, I'm Ben from Internachi, and we're here to do a home inspection. And I'm here with my buddies because I don't want to do a home inspection alone. So why don't you all introduce yourself? I'm Paul. I'm Glenn. I'm Hunter. I'm John. And I'm Sean. So enjoy this inspection video. Roof. According to the Internachi Home Inspection Standards of Practice, the home inspector has to inspect the following things. The roof covering materials, the gutters, the downspouts, the vents, flashing skylights, chimney and other roof penetrations, and the general structure of the roof from other vantage points. The inspector also must describe in the inspection port the type of roof covering materials, and then the inspector must also report as in need of correction any observed indications of active roof leaks. There are two types of roofs to inspect on this house. One is in the back of the house that's over the porch near the pool. So over there below us, that's where the pool is in the backyard. And then there's the main house roof. And the main house roof, the roof covering materials, is the same type as the siding. So the roof of the main house, um, which we're not going to walk on because um, it's unique and we might cause some damage. It's the same type of material, installation, uh, layers, uh, drainage plane, um, as the siding, the exterior siding covering materials. So um, that's very unique. So we're going to fly a drone and take a look at the roof from a safe vantage point, the ground. So um, we'll take a look at that. And so from this vantage point at the roof's edge, we can take a look at the, um, the roof covering material, um, the metal, stainless steel, and the fasteners, um, how it's connected to the structure of the roof, and the EPDM uh, rubber membrane material underneath. So rainwater comes down into the um, open slots of the uh, metal, uh, covering and then uh, drains off off onto the siding. There are no gutters. There's one gutter on the, the metal roof standing seam near the pool and we'll take a look at that. So behind me is the roof um, going in the back of the house over the rear porch and pool deck and near the pool. It's a standing seam metal roof. The material looks in good condition. Um, the concern is really all this rainwater being collected into this gutter and then draining off into one direction over there and spilling um, into a, uh, a garden area. And we have concerns about how the rainwater is being um, collected and discharged right next to the foundation of the house. So let's take a look at where this discharge of this very large roof in the back, collecting a lot of water, where it discharges. So here's the metal roof, the standing seam metal roof. The material is good. Um, large gutter to collect all the water and it slopes over here through the side fence and then over. And it discharges shooting towards the neighbor's house, but it actually lands right there where you can see some um, stones exposed because of the erosion during a rainstorm. And that's only um, several feet from the house foundation. So there's a lot of water being dumped right here. And this area of the ground on the right side of the house is level. And it's very close to the house foundation. Exterior. The inspector must in inspect the exterior wall covering materials. The home inspector must also inspect the eaves, the soffit, the fascia, a representative number of windows, all the exterior doors, the flashing trim, adjacent walkways and driveways, stairs, steps, stairways and ramps, porches, patios, decks, balconies, railings, guards and handrails and vegetation and surface drainage, um, especially where that drainage may adversely affect the structure 
due to moisture intrusion. Hello, I'm Sean McMullen with Sighthound Home Services. Today we're going to be going through an inspection of the exterior of this structure. I want to show you some of the parts where I start my inspection. Um, I always kind of look at where your water meter is, where your water main is, your, uh, your clean outs, some of these maintenance issues uh, that, that you need to be aware of in your, in your house, and then we'll check them and see if there's any deficiencies. So come on in, I'll show you what we got here. So right here we got the water meter, uh, the main coming in. We're going to check and verify that we don't have any water movement. So this dial is not moving at all. We check it for a couple seconds to make sure that it doesn't move. That tells us that there's no water movement through the house. So if there's any leaks, uh, a running toilet, anything like that. <clears throat> but it's not moving at all, so I think we're pretty good with that. This comes through here. We've got our main shutoff. Then we have a, a pressure uh, regulating valve. So because we have the PRV on site, that means we're gonna to have to have expansion tanks on the water heater uh, to make sure that we have uh, safe water pressure throughout the house. It's gonna come through here to the irrigation and we've got our backflow preventer device present. So with the irrigation, uh, we, we know we're not gonna be allowing any water to come back into the, uh, the main system. So we are proper in that regard. And it does have its own shutoff irrigation versus the rest of the house. So right here we've got the gas meter coming in. This is the trace wire for the line coming in. That is not the bonding wire. There should be a bonding wire back here to make sure that the meter is bonded to the grounding source for security. This house has a metal cladding on it, so there's concerns with electricity traveling through the actual cladding on the house. <laughs> As you can see, we've got two units here. If you look a little bit further over, there's actually three units on the side of the house here. We do not have adequate clearance around the units. You want clearance for uh, airflow as well as maintenance. The shutoffs are gonna be against the wall here. Those disconnects should be accessible uh, for maintenance as well as if there's an emergency. They're not accessible in their current uh, location. Underneath here uh, is a crawl space that we're not going to be accessing, but you can kind of see uh, a little bit of the support underneath the crawl space here. We don't have any skirting or anything to restrict critters or whatnot, <clears throat> but there is, I guess it's going to be considered ventilation for the crawl space because it's completely open on this side of the house. As we go around uh, clockwise around the exterior, we're going to be looking at grading. We're going to be looking at the foundation. Uh, I'm going to check the exterior cladding, whether um, there's gaps in sealant or concerns around windows. Uh, I'm not going to be uh, doing the roof, but we're going to kind of look at some stuff as we go around. So let's go ahead and make our way around clockwise. All right, as we're coming around, we're looking at the grating uh, at the front of the house. We have this large flower bed right here up against the house. Everything else slopes down and around, which is good. <clears throat> but when you get closer into the house, on top of this flower bed, everything kind of pitches towards the door. There is a central drain. I cannot find where that terminates, but there is a couple drains around the structure, which is good to remove water away from the house. But we do have a collection zone right here by the door, which is gonna cause concerns with this additional sidewalk that's been poured. The house is, is part slab and part pier and beam. Exterior outlets get checked to make sure they're GFCI. I've checked those and they are GFCI protected and there is a good cover on it, so that is nice. So if you see up here on the exterior, the windows, there's a couple shims from the installation of that window that are still protruding out. Uh, those shims should be trimmed off and there should be sealant around there to ensure moisture doesn't get in around those window frames. As we go around the exterior, we're checking for drainage, uh, how the, the grading is, is impacting the house. We've got a front flower bed on this side of the front door that's contained. Then along the side over here, everything kind of slopes in. We have another central drain down here in the drive to collect water that's gonna be coming off the roof as well as from the front yard. And then that's gonna be removed from the property. We have up here uh, some corrosion along the flashing, along the metal edge coming off the upper deck where water is coming down, landing right here. Uh, you can see the grating kind of collects here. It doesn't all travel towards the drain. So that's gonna be a concern of a low spot 
where it's going to collect water. If it's going to collect water, it can cause damage to the foundation, um, and that's something that we'll need to look at when we get to the interior. This cladding is secured to the exterior of the, of, of the, of the house with some furring strips. You can see here this looks like it's untreated or unfinished wood, so that's going to be a deterioration concern. That'll get noted uh, for maintenance for the house. Um, there's a screening material behind here, uh, presumably to keep uh, insects and uh, lizards and things like that out of the exterior. Um, but again, it's just going to uh, present concerns for ventilation around the exterior of the, of the home. We come along here, we have the exterior door. We check to make sure it's got good seals. Look around the, the base. We have more exterior outlets that have been tested, uh, GFCI protected. Make sure that they're not reverse polarity or an open ground. These outlets are all good as we come around. Now we're gonna come around the exterior side around where the pool is. Now there is a water spigot on the side of the house here. So we have to test the water pressure. Um, I used a, uh, a tester on it and the water pressure is coming up as 52 PSI. So that's within range. We do have a pressure uh, regulating valve on the water coming in, so it is operating correctly. We do have uh, tankless water heaters mounted to the exterior out here. Because there's a, a tankless water heater, we do have a pressure uh, regulating valve. We should have expansion tanks for each one of these to ensure safe expansion contraction of the water through the pipes. Both of these units are missing those expansion tanks. <clears throat> We're not gonna go into a, a, a deep dive into the water heaters at this moment. We're just kind of doing an exterior glance through. There is a power source down here with a weather box that is properly uh, making sure that the outlets are waterproofed. There is personal items stored along the side of the foundation that'll be noted that we can't fully inspect the entire uh, continuous line of the foundation because uh, we are not allowed to remove these items to inspect it. There's a large uh, knockout in the foundation down here. It would be concerning that that's going to continue to deteriorate and cause structural issues at the back corner of this uh, patio area. All uh, spigots should have an um, anti-siphon device on them. So this one here does not have an anti-siphon device mounted so that there could be uh, cross-contamination if there was a hose on here that could allow water to come back in through. So that would be written up as a deficiency. We have Christmas lights, decorative lights uh, wrapped around these trees. They use an indoor extension cord. That is a not, it's a non-grounded extension cord powering these lights. Um, if this is gonna be a permanent structure uh, that would need to be rewired properly with a grounded circuit so you won't have concerns because they are outdoors. We come over here and we have our main disconnect our main uh, service coming in, it is an overhead service. We can see up above here, we have our drip loop coming in, which is good, but we do have trees and brush actually engaging the lines. So we wanna maintain a five foot clearance coming through. So there's no concerns of limbs damaging your power coming in. <clears throat> the power source coming through here, we are awfully low to the ground. Um, this is, like I said, just a main disconnect uh, for the house. We have our panel further down here and then a sub panel inside. But as we're making our way around, we're notating these uh, so that when we get to the electrical portion, we have additional information available. This is where our main panel comes in for the house. It's properly labeled, which is good. It's a 200 amp service. We're not gonna take the dead front off, but we've got your ACs. We got our sub feed, which is an 80 amp sub feed going inside. We got our furnaces, dryer range, pool equipment, everything's in here. We have a cord put in here for to run those Christmas lights around those trees, but it's not on the proper side to where this cover can properly seal. So we have a permanent installation here and a good cover. It's just not completely um, secured in place to where you don't have to worry about water getting in. These outlets have been tested. They are GFCI protected, so that is correct. We look at flashing coming in to see, make sure everything is sealed, make sure everything uh, is looking good to keep water out. We go up and around. You can see there's some deterioration up here in the, uh, the soffit. And then this is where it comes off the roof. There's a gutter there that comes off the upper porch, the upper deck. 
and that just comes right down into a flower bed that's behind us. We have uh, exposed wire junction with wire nuts that's not secured in a junction box. So that's not good because it's also exposed to the elements. Come through here. This is the actual access hatch to uh, access the crawl space. Um, when we get in there, that's actually where there's two of the uh, air conditioning systems to um, replace your air filters, uh, put your bleach in your, your condensation lines. Two units are down here. One unit is upstairs in the attic. But you can go ahead and take a look underneath there. It's very tight. There are several deficiencies with the HVAC in the crawl space. All right, so we're just checking these joints. I smell some gas as I walk by. Just checking to see if I've got any active leaks or if it's just, just residual from the tankless water heaters fired up because they just fired up as I was walking by. So I'm not seeing any mention of any kind of leaks being identified by any of the joints here. But whenever you smell gas, it's always something that you want to verify and check <laughs> and make sure that it's nothing serious. This one's okay. Going through the exterior around the house, we've noticed uh, there's some grading concerns uh, with drainage. We want to always make sure that the grading is away from the house uh, so water doesn't pool or collect near the house. There's a couple drains in place, but it may not be sufficient to properly ensure moisture is not uh, pooling around the actual structure. Uh, looking at the exterior cladding with the, um, the metal strips that are put on, it is a very nice uh, design element, but for maintenance and concerns of getting to that subsurface, um, those untreated pieces of wood that, that we found, uh, making sure that we don't have any rot or water intrusion behind that element. <clears throat> the uh, crawl space, um, because that is an area for maintenance for the HVAC, it should be a much larger access point that is easily removable and replaced. That's where we have to replace the air filter. And again, like I said, um, put in uh, some bleach into the drain line to make sure that your condensate line actually uh, goes through like it should be. On the right side of the house, need adequate access around your, con uh, your condenser units for maintenance, preventative, as well as proper air circulation so that they function like they should to keep the energy bills down. That would be ideal. <laughs> And that's all I've got for the exterior perimeter around the house. Again, this is Sean McMullen with Sidehound Home Services. Appreciate you taking time to visit with us and go around the house. Have a great day. So we're on the side of the house and I'll show you that roof gutter extension that's spilling over. And it's above my head. So it's right there, comes off and discharges over here. And there's the erosion and can't see any water coming out but um, right here is the house foundation and negative drainage and you can see some puddling right there and then there's the crawl space access so it discharges out drains right here right next to the foundation so we're on the side of the house and where that rear um, upper level deck is this is where the discharge is and it lands right next to the grating along the, the side of the house here and this grating here um, is flat it's even negative and puddles up next to the foundation when it rains and we took a look at that um, when during a rainstorm and it really isn't diverting water away from the house it should be sloped away from the house and we're concerned also that there is some water penetration in here. The grating is right next to the bottom of the house wall and there's not a lot, not a lot of clearance at all and it may affect some of the structure below. So we've got poor control of roof water that pours right off of here from the upper level deck and it goes right into an area that is um, negative or at least flat and neutral that could puddle up right next to the house foundation. Basement, foundation, crawl space, and structure. A home inspector must inspect the foundation, the basement, the crawl space, and the structural components. And the inspector must describe in the inspection report the type of foundation 
and the location of the access to the underground floor space, like this one. The inspector will report as in need of correction observed indications of wood in contact or near the soil, like this. Observed indications of active water penetration, observed indications of possible foundation movement, such as unlevel floors, um, and we have that in the house. Any observed cutting, notching, boring of framing members that may, in the inspector's opinion, present a structural or safety concern. So here's the access to the underfloor space, the crawl space under the house, and you can take a look at the foundational components, um, the structure, um, and the rim, and the pressure treated wood, and the floor joists, and there's the floor up there. And we're a little concerned about how this flashing isn't sloped away from the house. And um, also this is an area where that roof gutter is, discharging a lot of water right next to the house foundation. And this area is very close. Um, so we're gonna go into the crawl space as best we can. Um, unfortunately, um, only about five feet and 10 feet uh, of access is available for us in the crawl space. So we can't go underneath uh, I would say 90% of the house foundation. It's unavailable. Heating and cooling. The home inspector must inspect the heating and cooling system using the normal operating controls. And the inspector must describe the location of the thermostat for the heating and cooling system, the energy source, and the heating and cooling method. And the inspector must report as in need of correction, any heating or cooling system that didn't operate, and if the heating or cooling system was inaccessible. There's um, two large um, HVAC units. The air handlers are in here, and uh, we're gonna look at the condensate and um, air filter and the ductwork and the clearances and the support and things like that. I know one air handler, um, just poking my head in there, has a problem with the um, water leak catch pan underneath the, the unit. And um, the structure itself is um, not ventilated. And um, the, we should have either a closed crawl space system or that's part of the, the house, indoor air, or um, it's insulated and closed off. And then the crawl space structure uh, under floor space is ventilated. Um, we have neither. So it's neither part of the house and it's not ventilated either with outdoor outside air. So um, a decision should be made so that we can control the, the energy efficiency, um, and there's energy issues, um, moisture issues, condens condensation problems, um, stagnant air. There's a, a dirt, exposed dirt floor inside the crawl space. Um, so um, something should be done and we do have some signs of um, excessive moisture and condensation and uh, probably a, a structural issue with the kitchen floor coming up that's affected by the, the large amount of water um, right next to the foundation. And we believe we can't see it, we can't get to it through this crawl space access, but we believe there's a, a pier, um, it's pier and beam structure and also um, this type of wooden structure foundation around the perimeter of the house um, and one of those piers has moved a little bit and we'll take it, take a look at the, the structural issue in the kitchen and we'll measure it actually how much it has uh, fallen. So um, I'm going to as a home inspector explain to my client that I can't see everything. The inspection is restricted, it's limited, um, but I'm going to do the best I can to identify the type of structure and look for um, signs of concern or issues that need further evaluation. Um, and uh, I think that's of great value to my client. Well, once again, we are here using what we call a zip level. It's a very precise level. Um, I don't know all the technical stats behind it, but it is, it can measure within a tenth of an inch on the foundation. You know, so Initially, when you set it up, you turn it on, obviously, and then you pick a spot in the floor 
in the foundation that you want to call the zero point. Everything will be measured from that point. And then occasionally you go back and recheck the zero. On this house, we're zeroing it right by the front door. And turn it on and then you hit zero. And when it zeroes, basically you take a picture of it and document it or where you're at. And then I always go to the kitchen area first and do, we use this to do spot checks. We do not do a foundation evaluation, but we will spot check to make sure that the things that we have found on the rest of the inspection, that this kind of agrees with that. Either the foundation is supporting the structure or it's starting to fail or um, it has an unlevel foundation at some point, okay? So we zeroed at the front door, we're moving to the kitchen. Always go try and get a spot in the middle of the, at the kitchen sink. And here on this, we are about eight tenths of an inch low here at the kitchen sink from the front door. Now we are on a crawl space foundation, so you, know, you can feel a little bit of slope in the kitchen floor, and that's just verifying what we're feeling. Yeah, I do a couple of different areas around the kitchen to check that again. And at this spot, we're right around an inch low. Yeah, so once again, it's telling us that from the front door to the side wall near the kitchen, we're about at eight tenths to an inch low. That will go over to the room off of the front door, which is on the opposite side of the house, and do the same thing, just to see how it measures. And on this side of the house, we're about two tenths high. So you've got a, <clears throat> from the right side of the house to the left side of the house, you're roughly an inch out of level. Now from there, we'll go to the back of the house. With the front door being zero, we'll go back and check zero, and we're good. So we go to the back of the house, and from the front door to the back, we're about two-tenths of an inch low. And then I like to do one on the back of the house on the right side. And we're about 0.7 of an inch low in the back right corner of the foundation. And from there, we'll go to the left corner. And on the back left corner, we're about two tenths of an inch low. So with that, we've spot checked the foundation for the entire house. We're anywhere from about three quarters of an inch low from the front door to the left side of the house. All right, we just completed the lower level of the house. Um, final thing that we're doing is spot checking with a zip level, which is a very precise instrument to measure the deflection of the foundation. You know, we went to the kitchen, we zeroed at the front door and then went to the kitchen in front of the kitchen sinks and we were about seven, about three quarters of an inch low. Yeah, and then from the kitchen, we went over to the family room window, which is on the right side of the house. We're about two tenths of an inch low over there. And then we'd go, we re-zero at the front door and then move to the back of the house in the center, which we were about two tenths of an inch low, and then checked each corner where we were also low. Now we are on a crawl space foundation, you know, but uh, so all we're doing is verifying some feelings that we've got when we are walking through the first level of the foundation of different sloping areas. Now, Glenn, he has that high tech thing, but I use old school. I'm gonna inspect 
the same kitchen because as a home inspector, I felt something on the kitchen floor. So all I do is I get these two balls and I just roll them on the floor. And I'd say there's some kind of low area right about here. Gravity is wonderful. And so if you want to go old school, grab a couple of these. Plumbing. The inspector must inspect the main water supply shutoff valve, the main fuel supply shutoff valve, the water heating equipment, and the TPR valve and other components related to that equipment the interior water supply, including all the fixtures and faucets by running all the water and flushing all the toilets, sinks and tubs and showers, and looking for functional drainage at the fixtures and any drainage sump pumps with accessible floats. And then the inspector must describe whether the water supply is public or private and the location of the main water supply shutoff valve and the location of the main fuel supply shutoff valve, the location of any observed fuel storage systems, we don't have that, and the capacity of the water heating equipment. The inspector will report as in need of correction any deficiencies observed in the water supply by viewing the flow of fixtures running simultaneously or any problems with the hot and cold water faucets, active plumbing leaks for sure that were observed during the inspection and any toilets that had defects. In relation to the hot water source, we have two tankless water heaters and um, they function and they're in good condition, uh, except for a couple things with the, the drip valve, uh, the drip fitting on the gas supply line um, could be installed better. We got some shutoff valves and a TPR valve. And what we wanna do is take a shot of the, the rating label. And that helps us identify the model number, the type of gas, and the recovery rating. And making sure that the TPR valves are installed and they should never be dripping. And they're dripping in a conspicuous area if they do drip. And we have an exterior receptacle here to power the units. Now we'll essentially test the hot water source or hot water sources by running water at the fixtures. Electrical. The home inspector must inspect the service drop, the overhead service conductors and attachment point, the service head, gooseneck, and drip loops, the service mast, service conduit and raceway, the electrical meter and base, the service entrance conductors, the main disconnect, and the panel boards and overcurrent protection devices like the circuit breakers, um, service grounding and bonding, and a representative number of switches, fixtures, receptacles, GFCIs, AFCIs, and the smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. And in the report, the inspector must describe the main service disconnect amperage rating, if labeled, and the type of wiring observed. And the inspector must report as a need of correction deficiencies in the integrity of the surface entrance conductors, the insulation, the drip loop, uh, the vertical clearances from the grade or the roofs, any unused circuit breaker panel openings that were not filled up, the presence of solid aluminum conductor, uh, solid conductor aluminum branch wiring, any uh, receptacles that had defects, and the absence of smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. And in the back here, we have the utility company line, telephone pole, the drop, there's the mast and the drip loop and the connection and there's the meter itself and then there's a disconnect and this is a little low. Let's see if we can open this up. There we go. And there's the main disconnect. 200 amps, and there's a GFCI exterior outlet. 
in the laundry room, we have the main electrical panel. We saw the meter outside, the main disconnect is outside, and then in this area here, we have the, the main panel, and it's filled with AFCIs and GFCIs, which is really good. So we've been tripping um, all the AFCIs and GFCIs throughout the house, and everything is working really well, and we don't see any deficiencies in the electrical panel or the disconnects. Attic insulation and ventilation. The home inspector must inspect insulation in unfinished spaces, including attics, crawl spaces, foundation areas. The ventilation in those areas, unfinished spaces, and the mechanical exhaust systems in the kitchen, bathroom, and laundry area. The inspector must also describe the type of insulation that was observed and the approximate average depth of insulation observed at the unfinished attic floor area or roof structure. The inspector must report as a need of correction the general absence of insulation and ventilation in the unfinished spaces. We'll go inspect the attic, check the roof construction, type of insulation, make sure everything's constructed properly. Um, this ladder is actually damaged and missing hardware, so we're not going to call it up there, but these are the type of things we look for. We're going to be inspecting this attic. Uh, the attic access ladder is actually damaged, so we've got our own ladder out here to take a look, but let's go see what we find. When we're up here, we're looking for obvious issues like moisture staining or damaged framing members, anything like that. Um, this house is built using rafters and stick built it. Um, we're also looking for you know, plumbing leaks. A lot of times the HVAC equipment will be located up here. We're making sure that that's installed properly and that the drain pan and condensate lines are running how they're supposed to. Uh, we'll also look at duct work. Make sure it appears to be in good condition and that you're getting good airflow throughout them. Uh, another thing we will look for is for all the mechanical exhaust vents located in the bathrooms. They are supposed to be vented to the exterior. So if you look right here, we got one that's coming from this guest bathroom right here. It appears that it just terminates into the attic. That'll just pump moist air into the attic and that's not a good thing. So that would be going on the deficiency list. Um, other than that, we're just checking for insulation. Make sure it's got good levels of insulation throughout. And that the overall attic construction is constructed properly. Um, I, I don't get it. Doors, windows, and interior. The home inspector must inspect a representative number of doors and windows by opening and closing them. The floors, walls, and ceilings, the stairs, steps, landings, and stairways, and ramps, the railings, the guards, the handrails, and the garage vehicle door and the operation of the vehicle door openers using the normal operating controls. And then the inspector must describe in the report um, a garage vehicle door is manually operated or um, operated with a garage door opener. And then the inspector shall report as in need of correction any improper spacing between intermediate balusters, spindles, and rails for steps and stairways and guards and railings, the photoelectric eyes, the safety sensors, anything that didn't operate with those, and any window in the house that had um, obvious fogging or lost seals or damage or cracked window panes. You know, the first thing I start out doing is I document the home when we get there. I take time stamp pictures of each room, actually the exterior also. But we'll go through and take pictures of each room. That way we have documentation of the condition of the house when we first started. With that, we'll start. You know, I'm taking pictures mainly to document the condition of the house. You know, we'll document all areas of the house, which I've already gone through and done majority of them. You know, we'll go to the kitchen and start checking the receptacles. We actually start checking the stove first, turn it on and make sure 
it all lights and functions properly. Once we get all burners lit, we'll take a picture and document it and say it's a functional stove. If not, we'll document what is wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with this one. We'll check the drawers, cabinets, just to make sure they work. You know, one of the things that we've noticed on this stove is on the griddle. You know, um, there's a grease trap underneath it, but it dumps into dumps the grease into the drawer below. So we'll document that in the report. And like I said earlier, we make sure all the gas valves are off, check all the drawers, cabinets, make sure they function. Look for dishwashers. We've already started the dishwasher in previous. Check cabinet drawers, doors. Check the windows. Make sure they are functioning properly, which this one does. We'll turn the water on in the kitchen sink to make sure the hot water and cold water are oriented correctly. Uh, if the hot water is forward, it'd be a child safety issue, so we make sure that we'll document that. We'll plug the drain and fill the sink partially full of water. Check the drain underneath just by feeling the P-trap and stuff to make sure it's not dripping or leaking. We also document the amount of stuff in underneath the sinks just so we can you know, document what is there. We will run the disposer just to make sure it is functioning properly. Check the high loop on the dishwasher. Then we start checking all the receptacles. Now I tripped these earlier. We will always note where the reset is for the kitchen, the bathrooms and all. And these, for the kitchen, the reset is in the uh, panel in the laundry room. So we'll check the power in all of these receptacles, the ones that we can get to. So this is a unique uh, microwave and to test it, sometimes uh, I'll just, uh, it opens up as a drawer. I'll throw a wet paper towel in there I'll close it and let's see if it works. That's an easy way to see if it works. So in about 10 seconds, that wet paper towel should be warm or maybe hot um, because I'm not bringing in any popcorn to any home inspection. So we'll give it a couple of seconds and uh, let's see, stop and then open and it should be warm. Yeah, nice and warm, hot, it works. Make sure the door closes, deadbolt works, and it's secure. We check the weather stripping, the condition of it, and document that. Check the threshold. This threshold is loose, so we'll document that. You know, one of the things that we do is we will call out observations versus deficiencies in our reports. Yeah, because there are times we observe things that we want to make the homeowner aware of. And it's not necessarily deficient. Yeah, but like I said earlier, we always go to the right. Checking power. Checking the windows that we can get to and open. If we have to move furniture to document to open something, we will not do it. All these receptacles look good. They're all wired correctly. We're checking for any incorrect wiring or you know, deficiencies within that unit. We will always try and leave the home like we found it initially. One of the things that we've noticed on this staircase is it is open to the walkway, you know, which it should from a safety perspective, it should have a handrail on the outside so no one can fall off. The other thing that we normally check is the height of the risers to make sure they're all within three-eighths of an inch of each other. These are off a little bit, you know, so we'll make note of that in the report. Some of these are seven inches, some of them are seven and a half inches. 
you know, so we'll document that. As we're going through the hallway, we check the power in all receptacles that we have access to. Once again, we check all outlets to make sure they're wired correctly, light switches, make sure all lights function. Continuing going right through the house. Check that receptacle. As we're going through the house, we're also looking at the ceiling for any uh, deficiencies in the ceiling, whether we have cracks or damage spots, water stains. You know, now we're entering the master bedroom and continuing to go right, making sure all receptacles have the correct power. Any closet doors open and shut, lights turn on. Go to the next door, light switch, turn it on, make sure the door functions. There's actually a crack up here in the corner of the wall, the two walls, and then the, there's a drop down section of the ceiling that looks like it has a settlement crack in it. Actually, there's a crack over here on the right side of the door right here, horizontal or vertical crack going from the door. All right, we're in the master bathroom now. One of the things that we uh, check for before we turn the shower water on is to make sure that the glass panels are safety rated and they have the etching on them. If not, we'll call that out as an observation. Most glass these days is tempered and safety rated, but we like to see the labeling on it. On this one, I do not see the labeling. So we'll make note of that and report. You know, we'll put a drain pan tester normally. This has got a full length drain as it exits. So, you know, we would run all the uh, faucets and showers, which this one has multiple heads. So I'm not going to be running the water today. Um, but we look to make sure it has hot water and cold water and that it drains properly. All right, this is the master bathroom water closet, which is somewhat unique. You open the door, the toilet automatically opens. Bent fan is on, it's functioning properly. It has mood lighting in it. Check to make sure that the toilet is secured and that it flushes properly. We'll come around to the receptacles. Make sure that they are GFCI protected. Once again, I've already checked these. And the reset is in the half bathroom off of the family room. So we'll make note of that in the report. We check both hot and cold water in each sink. Make sure the drain stoppers are functioning. Let them fill up with water. If they have an overflow, we typically let it fill up to the overflow to make sure the overflow is connected and draining properly. This has both hot and cold. It is draining properly with no leaks. Has hot water, has cold water, draining properly. And no leaks. Make sure all the lights functioning properly. They are. Check this receptacle. We're checking the master bathroom tub right now and it's got multiple faucets. Uh, make sure you know how to switch the faucets before you turn them on because you may get wet. Drain stopper is functioning. Once again, you want to check hot and cold. Take a little while for the
Make sure everything's secured. Now we're getting warm water. Make sure the stopper is functional if you can. If you can see underneath, great. If you can't, make sure you're not leaking anywhere. Uh, tub appears to be draining properly. All right, one of the things that we've noticed in the bathroom hallway transition flooring is there's some separation of the floor. So we will document that. Take pictures of it, put it in a report and document it. There also feels like there's a little bit of a high spot there. We'll come back with a zip level and verify you know, whether there's a high spot or not. With that, we continue into the master bedroom. We'll check the receptacles that are um, accessible. The other thing is we do is we check doors for functionality and weather stripping to make sure they are sealed against the weather. Yeah, it's not much of a lock, but at least it does lock. And uh, here is the pool alarm. Yeah, so it is correct. It operates nicely and appears to be sealed into the floor. We will go through and check all smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors if the house has gas. You know, we're not going to do that in this house, but there is a smoke alarm present in the master bedroom. One of the things that we've done when we came in is we took pictures of the thermostat and make sure, you know, what the setting is so we can leave the home as we found it when we uh, leave. Yeah, we check all lighting, make sure all switches. You know, if a bulb is burned out, we'll normally make it as an observation. Once again, checking receptacles that we can get to. Make sure all lights are working. Checking the functionality of the doors. This is a sliding door to the pool area. Once again, you check for the pool alarms. It is there. There is a securing latch for the door. You know, um, make sure it will engage. It does engage. This is a heavy door, so it's hard to slide. Yeah, we'll normally check the floor outlets too to make sure that they have power to them. So far, all the receptacles have been wired correctly. We have a hallway to a bathroom, half bath. This is the half bath where all the GFCI resets for all the bathrooms in the house are. We check the half bath, turn on the lights, make sure the vent fan's functioning. Check the faucets. Make sure the hot and cold are running. Document what's underneath. Hot and cold seem to be fine. Once again, make sure the toilet is secured. Make sure it flushes properly. There is no sink stopper in here. We'll make that as an observation. We check the receptacle to make sure it is wired correctly and tripping properly. You know, one of the things that you'll notice and you need to look for, anything that you cannot get to, you want to document. There's a receptacle behind this picture on the edge. You know, so just need to document it. So if in the future there is no power to it, you, you, know, you can tell the client what it was when you were here doing the inspection. We continue into the laundry room. Document what's underneath the utility sink. Make sure... Nothing is leaking, and that it is piped correctly, and drain pipes are done correctly. If you can get to the receptacles, these are plugged in, so we won't check them. It is a GFCI receptacle, so that's good. If you've got a washer and dryer in place, we always check the dryer by just running the dryer, you know, to make sure that it is heating. If the washer and dryer are not in place, we will use a meter and make sure that we have voltage at the dryer outlet. These are both in place. All right, here we go. Here's the dryer. Sometimes you got to figure out the dryers. Wow. Well, this is interesting. I can't get this one to work. This one is actually tied to the lint filter. 
tell you check the lint filter. It has a sensor in it saying the lint filter. Well, I cannot get this dryer to work at this time. It just keeps saying the lint filter, which the, we check the lint filter and it's clean. Uh, as we continue right, we wind up back in the breakfast room and kitchen area. We check all the lights from these light switches. They work. Is missing a screw in the cover. We'll document that. Once again, we're checking all receptacles, make sure they have power. Which they do. And check windows. And it functions properly and it's smooth operation. So with that, we are finished with the downstairs. And once again, I'm Glenn with H2H Professional Inspections doing the first floor of this property. According to the Home Inspection Standards Practice of Internachi, you don't have to inspect the clothes washer and dryer, but we did. Um, it did a short cycle of uh, some towels and the dryer did not work. Um, wasn't disclosed, um, but we couldn't get the dryer to turn on. It didn't dry the towels, so we've got some wet towels in the dryer. So if I follow the exhaust pipe, I think it goes around to the outside. And there it is, right next to the half bath exhaust hood. And from here I can see that the hood needs to be cleaned. It's filled with a lot of lint and debris and a cleaning would help reduce the potential for a fire hazard at the laundry exhaust. Right, I'm Hunter with H2H Professional Inspections. Um, we're doing an inspection on the upstairs portion of this house. We will check all walls, ceilings, um, electrical, basically everything we come in contact with. So we'll check for power on the receptacles, make sure it's wired correctly. Everything appears to be wired correctly. We're looking for cracks and in the wall and ceiling. Um, try to find a pattern, so either go left all the way or right all the way. And just as we go along, we'll check for all the doors, make sure they close, open and close properly, that they function. All the screws are in place and the hinges. All right, make sure the door opens and closes properly and it latches like it's supposed to. Make sure the lights function. If there's ceiling fans, we'll also make sure the ceiling fan functions. Um, then we're just looking, make sure all the receptacles have power and they're wired correctly. There. Looking for cracks in the drywall and then the ceiling. Again, with any doors. Make sure all the locks work. On our uh, deadbolts, it's gotta be an actual manual lever on the inside portion. It cannot be a keyed deadbolt. It's for safety concerns in case of emergency if you have to get out of the house. Make sure all the doors work. You got power everywhere you're supposed to. Um, if windows are accessible, we will check the windows. If they're not accessible, then we can't get to them. Again, checking the doors. Make sure the lock works correctly. Make sure they latch like they're supposed to. Again, with lighting. Which actually dimmers, make sure they dim correctly. One of the other things we look for is door stops. See if door stops are in place. Make sure you're, that your walls stay protected. Power at all receptacles. Make sure that the sliding doors are in the track and functioning as they are supposed to. And then just looking for any settlement cracks, moisture damage, anything like that on the walls and in the ceiling.
application. Make sure the windows open and close like they're supposed to and that they latch properly. Make sure the glazing isn't damaged. Everything's good. Got power. More power. Then again, see here with the tape joint is starting to crack a little bit. Make sure the door slides and functions like it's supposed to. Make sure it latches properly, which it does. Check all the lights. All the lights work. Run the water. Make sure that the drain pipe underneath isn't leaking. Make sure we have hot water and cold water both at the faucet. We'll fill it up, and well, we can test for leaks a little bit better as it drains. We'll also fill it up to make sure that the overflow is connected properly. We're waiting for that to fill up. This is a bathroom, so it's got to be GFCI protected, which it is. It's still filling up, so we'll go check the toilet. Make sure it's nice and tight, and it's sealed to the floor, which it looks like it is. Just now reaching the overflow, so we'll make sure it's not leaking out of there. That all seems to be working like it's supposed to. Now we'll drain it and feel all the connections, see if we can feel any leaks or any water dripping. We'll also check for functional drainage, make sure that the drain's not stopped and, or clogged. This one appears to be good, doesn't look like it's leaking. Uh, next, on the shower enclosure, what we're looking for here, because it's glass doors, that all sections of the glass have to have the tempered glass etching in it. Should be on every section of the door or of the glass. So right here, we've got the tempered glass etching. Another one right here. Do we have one on the third? And then there's another one over there. So that is all good. Got to test the shower head. Um, we'll test the shower pan, make sure that it was sealed behind the tile correctly. Uh, we have a special stopper that allows us to fill up the shower pan with roughly an inch and a half, two inches of water. And then we'll let it sit for a little bit, uh, looking for to make sure that it was sealed properly behind the tile and that water doesn't leak out onto the floor and behind the wall. Make sure we got hot water like we're supposed to and all the grout is in place. Again, as we come in here, we check all the lights, make sure they function properly. If ceiling fans are in place, we'll test those. Check all the doors. This door appears to be missing the locking mechanism, so we would note that. The, uh, the strike plate is also loose. It needs to be tightened up and adjusted a little bit. Check all the receptacles. Check all the windows were accessible. Even if they're not accessible, we like to at least look at them, make sure that they're not damaged in any kind of way. Everything appears to be correct. Make sure the door latches and opens as it's supposed to. Make sure the weather stripping is in place around all sides. All of which appears to be good. Power. And again, just looking for any settlement cracks, moisture staining, anything like that in the walls and ceiling. Make sure all the lights work. Make sure it's GFCI protected, which it is. Again, checking for the shower glass, making sure that it's tempered, that it's got the etching on it. And there it is right there, so we're good there. 
Turn the water on. Make sure we have hot and cold water. And that it drains correctly. Make sure all the grout is in place and not cracking or missing, along with all the sealant. Make sure the toilet is nice and secure, it flushes properly, and that all the components are in good working order, and that it's also sealed to the floor and not loose. Make sure the fan works. And then again, coming over to the sink, we're gonna fill it up, make sure it's got hot and cold water, make sure the drain stopper is functional and it's functioning properly. We got hot water. We got cold water. A lot of times you will have a condensate line that ties into a drain line underneath the sink. Uh, you want to make sure that that connection is also tight and not leaking. This completes the upstairs portion for this inspection. Uh, this is Hunter with H2H Professional Inspections. There isn't an attached garage. It's really our carport, attached carport and there isn't a garage door opener. Although I do have an opener here and it's for the gate. So if I click the button, we can see if the gate works. So that's good. Let's go back inside. So just a, a quick check of the, the gate controls. It's lift master. There's a, a key disconnect there. The wiring looks fine. Some welding there. The unit itself with the antenna. I mean, the door doesn't line up, but that's pretty much minor. It still functions. During every home inspection, I'll use an infrared camera on every inspection. And one of the things that I do for my clients so that they understand I'm not seeing through walls is that I'll put my hand on the wall, three, two, one, and then I'll get my infrared camera out. And this one is a, a FLIR C5, and then they'll see my handprint. And I'll show, tell them that what I'm, we're looking for is differences in temperature on the surface of things, anomalies on the, on the temperature surface right there. So um, if I see something like that, that shouldn't be warm on the wall. Or sometimes a, a cold spot will be an indication of, possible indication of moisture intrusion or a receptacle that feels warm I could use my infrared camera to confirm what I see. Um, maybe an electrical panel breaker that's overfused or hot, excessively hot, like over 140 degrees or something like that, or at the attic access panel, or just around the walls and ceilings of a house to see if there are any thermal bridging or thermal insulation problems. So let's take a look at those areas with my infrared camera. So at the front entry door, use my infrared camera and see if we have any cold spots. It's cool outside. So we'll take a look, see if there's anything going on there. That looks fine. Taking a look at the appliances in the kitchen will tell me what is on and what is off fairly quickly. So at the refrigerator, I can see that the refrigerator is on. And with an infrared camera, you have to be trained and how to use it, so don't get fooled. That's me in that shiny surface there. But that is heat, and that looks normal coming out of the refrigerator. So here's a couple of wall switches, wall receptacle, and a thermostat. And you can see that thermostat seems to be very highly hot, but it's actually at a normal rating. So don't be fooled by that as well. And then if you're trying to figure out 
which register does what in a home, maybe using an infrared camera can help you determine what is cool and what is hot, what is a supply and what is a return. In the bathroom, we turn on the fixtures, hot and cold water. You can see this is what the hot water looks like and underneath. So infrared really helps you see things that you wouldn't be able to see without it. So using the infrared, you have to be trained to see what you're looking at. So I'm looking through the glass at the master bathroom shower. The hot water is on and I really don't see any hot water, but that's what glass does to infrared. So if you turn the corner, there's the hot water, right? And above, there's the shower fixture there. So let's move around the glass and by magic, it just disappears. So get trained and certified to use infrared with InterNACHI. And infrared helps me determine whether this register is part of the system I'm inspecting it doesn't seem to be. There's no difference in temperature around this register. So I haven't turned on this system apparently yet. There's a register over there. Here's a return. So no anomalies, nothing's cool or hot. So I, that helps me determine what register is connected to what system. And so I'll use an infrared camera just to quickly scan an entire room to see if there are any anomalies, anything of major concern. So the perimeter, that seems fine. We've got some warm light fixtures, that's fine. And something on that piece of furniture, and that's an electronic device, that's fine. Helps me quickly scan. So the electrical panel, main distribution panel is in the laundry room. And using my infrared camera, I see the two hotspots. That's the coffee maker there and the electrical panel itself. And if we open the door, let's see if we can get a, a measurement if you wanted to, you don't have to. So you can see the temperature difference there. And you don't want anything over 140 degrees on the electrical panel. So at this interior wall, I see that we have a register, it's a supply, and the heating system is on. If we move up, then there's something excessive about the heat there, and it, I don't think it's from that register below. So the infrared allows me to see what is going on, and ah, that's it. It's the wine cooler. So there's the heat exhaust, essentially from the cooler, and that's what we see on the other side of the wall. Infrared allows me to quickly scan for any type of water penetration around the perimeter of the wall that I'm concerned with. And this perimeter of the wall had a roofing drainage issue that was spilling next to the foundation and the window. And we had a little flashing area of concern on the outside. And this allows me to quickly scan to see if there's any kind of indication of moisture intrusion, and I just don't see any. And looking at the floor, looks normal, but using the infrared camera, I can see, hmm, some anomalies, and the cool marks, the blue marks, are really just from people coming in to the house from the pool area. Again, we're in the bathroom, and infrared just allows me to see things that I wouldn't be able to see without it. For example, I have cool water turned on so I can see what that looks like. And there's the cool water going through the drainage pipe. And let's see what's underneath. Any leaks? Nope. 
and let's flush the toilet. And let's see what it looks like. Cool water, obviously in the toilet itself. And this toilet is suspended off the floor and no water leaks there. Hi, uh, my name is John. I'm with Austin Home Check here um, in Austin, Texas. Um, we do home inspections all throughout the area um, of homes, pools, um, just different areas like that. Um, today I'm gonna inspect the swimming pool at this house. Um, we're gonna look at a few, a few different things um, for the safety barriers, um, you know, the access to the pool, the pool structure itself, and then some of the, electric, uh, the equipment um, at the side of the house. Um, so I wanna start first with, with this door. Um, so this is an access point from the house to the pool. And all access points to the pool should have an alarm system or a way to notify people that, that live at the house that the door's been opened in case there's kids um, that might open the door and sneak out. You want to be alerted by that. Um, so this is the first thing that we'd call out. Um, so we'll go around the pool and check out some more things and then uh, just follow me. So talking about safety barriers and access to the pool um, like we did with the door earlier, um, exterior access should, have, should be blocked from just any kids that may wander up to the home. Um, so this home should have a gate right there that closes towards the pool. So if a kid walks up to the house, they push on the gate to try to open it, it actually closes shut. Um, as you can see right here, there's not, a, there's not a gate at all. So people can just walk right in um, and gain access to the pool, which is a huge safety hazard for folks that maybe can't swim. Continuing on with safety, once you actually get to the pool, we're looking at the, the tiles and the decking and the coping around the pool to make sure that everything's solid and, and, and not gonna move. Um, the idea is if you know, children walk on there, um, you don't want the tile to break and shift and then cause them to fall into the pool. So I'll walk around and step on everything and mess with all the tiles and just make sure that everything's nice and tight um, and not damaged in any way. So the next thing we look at is the drains of, of the pool. Um, so pools should have two drains that are at least three feet apart. Uh, this prevents an entrapment hazard from, from occurring. Um, older pools, some of them had one drain um, and it had extremely strong suction. So um, there's been drownings and things like that when, when folks would get caught on the drain itself. Um, so now you have to have two drains so that the pressure of the suction um, is not as much and then there's still, you know, someone can get out. Um, if it does have an older pool and it has one single drain, there should be other mechanisms to kind of have a release such, like, such as a vacuum release to where the pump turns off um, and someone can escape um, and, and, you know, potentially not drown in those situations. So you can see this pool has two drains um, that are at least three feet apart, so that's good. So the next thing that we look at with the pool is the structure of it and the surface of it. So we want to make sure that um, the forms aren't visible and any rebar that may have been used to form the pool um, is not visible and there's no rust in the pool, no cracks things like that that could cause a problem. Um, so looking at this pool, don't see, don't see any rust, don't see any cracks or anything that could potentially be leak points on this side. So that's good. And then the other thing we're looking at is the levelness of the water. So as you can see how it meets the tile in the back, you wanna kinda see a straight line. If it's different, then you can see that the pool is shifting a little bit. Um, so that's an indicator of that. Um, so we're going to look at that right now and, and see what we can find. So I don't see any issues with that. Um, a tip to do this that makes it easier is make sure everything is off in the pool. That kind of calms the water, makes it easier to look at as well. So looking at the exterior shell of the pool, you can have indicators of, of water penetrating through. Um, so this right here is called efflorescence. And it's basically as the water goes through, salt deposits are, are left on the surface of it. So it can be an indicator of a potential leak. Um, now we didn't see any cracks in the shell, uh, in, in the surface of the pool on the inside, but this here is a little waterfall feature. So it's gonna have some plumbing coming through over here. So there could potentially be, you know, minor leak or something kind of getting back behind there as well. Um, so we wanna get that checked out. All right, getting to the pool equipment here. You've got your heater, you've got your filter, the piping, the plumbing and all that stuff. Um, so a couple of things here, you got your pumps. Um, we're looking for bonding of the electrical equipment or of the, of the, the metal equipment, so the heater, the, um, the, the pumps, uh, make sure that everything's properly bonded and has the same potential. Um, so as I go through that, there's a, there's a bonding wire connected to the heater, which looks good. But this pump right here doesn't have the bonding wire. So you can see that it's here and it goes uh, right there. Um, and it's not attached. Um, and there's other areas over here where the bonding wire is not attached. So we're gonna recommend that get connected. Another thing with the plumbing, so you can see this is PVC plumbing. 
Um, and it's pretty shaded here. However, there is some open and some sun that can get in here. Um, so anytime there's a risk of the sun touching the PVC, um, you want to have it painted because the sun deteriorates PVC and over time you could develop leaks in this area. All right, so now we're going to turn it on. So one of the things we check when we're running the pool and the heater is to make sure that it operates properly. So the heater, water is flowing, is getting pumped from the valve into the heater and then back out and into the pool, which warms your pool. Now, the way it works, the heater should not be on if the pump is off. So we're gonna test it to make sure that when we turn the pump off, the heater also turns off. And it did, so that's good. And then another thing with the gas is because it's exterior, it should have rigid uh, piping. So the piping going into the heater is, is, is steel, which is good, but as it turns a corner right behind here, behind the equipment, you can see CSST. So all that should be protected from mechanical damage um, by either having a conduit around it or changing it to the rigid piping because it's outdoors. So now, as we're operating the equipment, we're gonna check the other features. So this pool has a waterfall, it has a pool sweep, um, and we're gonna check the lights to make sure everything works. Um, so we're just gonna push these buttons one by one go look at the pool and make sure that everything's coming out or working the way it should be um, and then um, sign off on it. So as we turned on the lights and the and the, the waterfall feature you can see that the waterfall feature is working you can see that the lights are on so now we're going to also check to make sure that the GFCI um, that the lights are connected to um, works properly. So we're going to go back to the equipment and trip the button um, and see if the lights turn off. So one of the final things we do, um, you know, just e as we were looking at the, all the equipment, like I said, we we're making sure there's no leaks, making sure that the, uh, the filter pressure is where it should be. So this pressure gauge looks like it's right at uh, 14. So we're looking for any high pressure or low pressure that, that may indicate that this needs to be backwashed. Um, so anything less than five or above 20, depending on the kind of uh, filtering you have. Um, so it's kind of right in the middle, so it looks good. Again, no leaks, um, didn't see any issues with the electrical. Um, looks like this pool might be good to go. All right, so that concludes our pool inspection. Um, so some of the big things we check obviously are very, very much safety related, barriers to the pool, um, the structure of the pool, just to make sure that no one can accidentally fall in, the drains to the pool, and then just making sure that it operates the way it's supposed to operate. Um, so my name is John with Austin Home Check. Um, so anytime you need a, a, an inspection of a pool or a house or you know just whatever you need in terms of inspections here in Austin, give us a call. Um, we're at austinhomecheck.com or the phone number is 512-298-2685. Um, you know, this was fun. Lots of good references in terms of you know things that we've learned from InterNACHI itself to um, just, just getting you know good at doing pool inspections for folks. Until next time, uh, my name is John Nunez with Austin Home Check. Um, give us a call if we can help in any way. So that was a home inspection of a very unique house with my buddies. I hope you enjoyed watching the video and stay safe out there and I'll see you on the next home inspection. I'm Ben from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. Bye.